Cool. So um, I guess we can get started. Um, and just so everyone knows, we are also broadcasting through Facebook Live. So there will be a video and we'll have it on speaker view. Um, but to start things off, um, so for um, thank you all so much for joining us today. And for anyone not familiar um, with the events that we host here, um, we have the monthly effective animal advocacy um, meetups and webinars um, and often panel discussions on a variety of topics related to advocating for animals more effectively. Um, and then we also have a monthly aquatic animal focused effective animal advocacy meetup as well. Um, so we're really excited this month to have Casey and Tom from Faunalytics um, sharing with us about their 2020 research, um, which covers a whole, whole range of topics. Um, and I'm personally really excited to just hear more details on everything. Um, they'll be giving you a little bit more background on Faunalytics itself, um, but to give you a little bit of background on them, um, so Tom has an MA from UBC in psychology where he studied social support and chronic pain patients and he is currently finishing a PhD at uh, University of Guelph in, um, applied, I can never say that word, I'm sorry. Guelph, yeah, I know it's totally normal. It's University of Guelph and everybody yeah, does that, yeah, sorry. Okay, it's actually easier to say than I thought, apologies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so University of Guelph in Applied Social Psychology, where he is studying um, the association between social norms and vaccine hesitancy. He is an accomplished research scientist who has conducted a number of studies for phonolytics um, and who has helped with other, other work, um, such as their impact evaluation and research prioritization. Um, he also has a very cute companion kitty named Soda, who maybe we'll see today. He's, um, he's... And then uh, Casey is the communications and development manager at Bonalytics, where she focuses on engaging and informing animal advocates in new and innovative ways. Casey graduated from the inaugural class of NYU's Animal Studies Master's Program in 2020, where she, where she researched reptile protection and co-launched New York City's first veterinary clinic for families experiencing homelessness with companion animals. Um, Casey also earned a master's degree in social psychology from the London School of Economics and has a master's uh, bachelor's degree, <laughs> I cannot talk today, um, in communication and psychology from the University of Miami. Um, prior to joining Phonolytics, she spent over five years working as a communications consultant in the US, UK, and Australia. Um, so I'll be handing it off to Tom and Casey um, and then jumping back in for the audience Q&A. So definitely feel free to add in any questions in the chat um, throughout the presentations, and then we'll get to them um, after Casey and Tom are done talking. So thanks so much. Thanks so much. Oh, um, uh, do you want to launch the uh, PowerPoint now? Yeah, it's been disabled. So Rocky, if you could allow me to share my screen. Uh, you should be able to now. Okie dokie. Uh, hold on one sec. Let's try this. Sorry, I got a grant privacy access apparently. Yay, Zoom meetings. Yeah. <laughs> well, while Tom's doing that, I do just want to say um, thank you so much, Rocky, and the Aquatic Life Institute team for having us. Um, we are so excited to be here. And though this is an overview on um, quite a few of our studies that we produced in 2020, I will say that much of them do much of the studies do impact aquatic animal advocacy in particular. So we do think it's a, a really great fit for us to talk about it today. And um, we are so honored to be here and to be invited. So thank you. Okay, I think we're up and running now, yeah? Yes. Perfect, one sec. Cool. Feel free to skip to slide three, Tom, since we've been introduced. Sure, sounds good. <laughs> so before I hand things over to Tom, I do want to quickly take just a minute to talk a little bit about Faunalytics and what we do and some of our key programs that we offer for animal advocates. Um, I do see a lot of familiar faces, so this may be repetitive for some of you, but thank you for bearing with me. Um, Faunalytics is a capacity building organization in our movement. And so we primarily work behind the scenes to provide research and analysis uh, for animal advocates to make them more effective in their efforts to reduce animal suffering. 
much of the research that we do is about our audience. So we try to reach, um, you know, the public and understand uh, what they think about animals, their attitudes towards animal issues so we can change them. But because we are an overall capacity building organization, we also look at other topics too. So for example, retaining animal advocates, uh, successful donation appeals, and anything that we can do to help grow our movement as a whole. Go ahead, Tom. Sorry. Yes. There we go. Cool. So if you want to click it twice, because apparently there's an animation on this slide. There you go. <laughs> so <laughs> learn that the hard way. Um, so we offer a few key programs that I wanted to quickly mention. The first is our most well known is our original our original research program. This is what we will be discussing today. And we have a formal research prioritization process in place to make sure that we are selecting studies that address neglectedness, uh, scale, feasibility, cost, and we do a research participation process every few years. Our next one is going to come up next year in 2021. And I'm mentioning this because we will be soliciting feedback on research ideas from the general animal protection movement. So please keep an eye out for that as we definitely would love to hear from everyone here on what studies you think are important for us to look at next year. We also have a research library where we take external studies and we summarize them for animal advocates. We currently have about 4,200 studies in that library, and we add hundreds of new ones every single year. And then finally, we have a program called our office hours or pro bono support, and that is where we offer one on one support to other animal charities with things like impact evaluation, um, finding data that they need, any sort of research support that they could be looking for. And then we do have some, we did have some exciting growth this year. We produced seven original studies, some of which we will be chatting about today. We added 250 articles to our research library. We helped over five dozen advocacy organizations and individual advocates via our office hours. And then as of today, we've had over 515,000 visits to our site in 2020. And over 5,000 people receive our data directly for, through our email alerts and our newsletters. And finally, we are a very proud ACE recommended charity. We are a standout charity since 2015. So without further ado, I will now stop talking and hand it off to Tom, who will be discussing our research. Great. Thanks so much, Casey. Um, so as Casey mentioned, we, we did a total of seven studies. Uh, we selected sort of five of them that we thought might be of most interest. They're all available on our website, as she mentioned. So. If there are others that we don't cover, um, or if you want more details, there's a lot more details there. Everything's hosted on the OSF too. So if you wanna look at materials or if you wanna look at the open source data, head over there. Um, so the first uh, study that we'll talk about today was a case study actually. Um, so we collaborated with a cafe on a college campus um, and wanted to see if there are any changes in what people were buying over time at that cafe, because it's kind of one of the open questions in the in the movement is, are, are people changing their diets to what extent over what period of time and, and there's more and more good data coming out, but we were working with the, the cafe for another project and we had access to their data so we thought this is a great opportunity. Um, so we had historical data from this veg friendly cafe on a college campus It was in Ottawa, Ontario. Um, we actually had data for the last five years. So their, their total sales basically for five years by date uh, or by year, I guess it was. Um, and importantly for what we looked at, the number of veg options on the menu didn't change year over year. So it was a way to sort of, you know, we had a bit more control over, over well, I guess we didn't really have control, but it, it helps us have a bit more confidence that it wasn't the menu changing that that led to the changes. Um, and what we saw is that over time, the proportion of vegetarian orders um, increased by 13%. So that year over year increase in, in vegetarian orders was going up, uh, which was great to see. And again, without a, without a menu change. Um, we also saw that veg orders displaced meat orders. Um, so it wasn't just that, you know, um, people were eating more of everything, but this was the proportion of um, orders um, is swinging more towards vegetarian and veg friendly or um, options. So. Um, 
we think about this a bit in terms of nudges in social psychology. So encouraging people to make a, a positive choice, but without forcing it. Um, so in the case of the restaurant, all but one of the 11 breakfast items, uh, which is the BLT, have a vegetarian option by default. So if you do want meat, then you have to like put it as an add-on to what the original order is. Um, so it's a way to just set the default as vegetarian and then make somebody take an extra step um, if, if they want to, um, want to add meat to it. Um, so it's a small thing, it's relatively subtle, uh, but there's more research coming out as well that you know, putting vegetarian options at the front of a, of a cafeteria line can help, um, those types of things. So sometimes it's a, it's a smallish change um, that, can, that can help nudge people in the right direction without being too heavy handed, too overt, any of those kinds of things. Um, we also saw a shift in the type of vegetarian options that people were ordering. Um, so orders of pitas that have like a, a plant-based protein like tofu and it have increased and more basic sort of veg pitas like eggplant based have decreased. Um, so it's people seem to be switching over and understanding a bit more of a balanced veg diet and the importance of, of getting that protein and tofu obviously has other stuff in it too. But those veg protein options are on the rise among like as part of that class. So, um, so this study was pretty basic, but it gives a sense of the trends in vegetarian orders over time at this one small cafe at this one university in, in Canada. Um, but we also partnered with the same organization um, to look at messaging. Um, so to see whether a reducitarian message or a vegetarian message was more effective. So same cafe, but instead of just looking at historical order data, we had an intervention um, and then gave people gift certificates for the cafe and kept track of what they actually ordered while they were there. Um, so in order to get the gift certificate, we had people watch videos. Um, there was a control group and it was just text-based and described, um, described the study. Um, the two main videos, um, so, the, so that the control group just described the study and, and basic stuff with the text. Um, the reducer go veg videos describe the benefits of plants, excuse me, plant-based eating. Um, they showed some mild factory farm footage. Um, we didn't want to, again, be too heavy handed with it, um, just to have, to have some background, some education for people on it. Um, and to also describe the changing social norms around meat consumption. So that's just saying, you know, vegetarianism is on the rise, more and more plant-based orders, more and more people that you'll meet will be vegetarian, those kinds of things. Um, there were two key strategies that were used as mentioned in the videos. So one, we had, um, we asked people to pledge to reduce their meat intake. So this is a reducitarian appeal. And in the other, we asked people to go vegetarian. So this is a please stop eating meat um, approach. And what we found um, was that the overall, the reducitarian message uh, had the greatest reduction. So 25.8% of participants who saw the reduction advocacy video ended up selecting a meatless meal when they went to the cafe. Uh, whereas the vegetarian advocacy video, 18.9% uh, of people ordered a meatless meal. Um, this was due in large part to the fact that more people, significantly more people were willing to pledge to reduce their consumption of meat than to cut meat out entirely. Um, so much easier ask to ask people to reduce. Um, now, follow through was higher in, after people, so among the people who took the vegetarian pledge who agreed, follow through at the cafe was higher than among those who, who took the reducitarian pledge. But because so many more people took the reducitarian pledge, it still led to the greatest number of vegetarian orders, which is our main outcome of interest, obviously. 
We also found that the videos themselves didn't have much of an effect. The control group was pretty similar to the, the two like video groups. Um, so in some ways we wonder, is it, is it really about that messaging in the video or is it people are already kind of ready for that last little push and that ask to sort of step over the line and just make a commitment to, to reduce or to go veg. In this case, we think that, you know, asking for that, that easier next step of, of reducing looks like it would be the winner. Um, so yeah, overall the reducitarian messaging um, and ask did lead to more, um, more vegetarian orders. Um, it might be worth mentioning as well. So we said that follow through at the cafe was higher among people who took the vegetarian pledge. Um, while that's certainly true for the order, there, there might be something else that was going on there as well, where, you know, we gave people a coupon to help with, to pay for the price of the pita that they were ordering, pitas that they were ordering. Um, and often the meat pitas were more expensive. And so we thought, well, maybe they were using that coupon, you know, these are students, <laughs> students. And so maybe they're using that coupon on the more expensive item to save as much money as they can. And then they're still going to reduce in other ways. Um, so, you know, in their meals at home or those kinds of things are at a restaurant when, when it is out of pocket. Um, so yeah, overall takeaway, reducitarian, um, reducitarian led the way there. And we think it's, it's again, that sort of smaller ass, that nudge idea that maybe was, was helping with that effect. Uh, so on to our next study, um, we partnered with Farm Sanctuary in the US. Um, and so they have two main locations um, and we ran an evaluation of their like on-farm tour for them. Um, we had a paper and pencil survey um, and over 1200 people completed it at the two different locations. Uh, we also split this group up. So some participants did the survey before the tour um, and some did the survey after the tour. And this allowed us to see whether or not the tour had any effects, right? So we can see what are people's attitudes and behaviors and intentions for diet change as they pull up in the parking lot basically, or they're out of the cars and getting the, the survey, but before they've done the tour. Um, and then compare that to after they've been on this tour and met the animals and, and seen the video that Farm Sanctuary presents and, and heard the information that the tour guides present on the tour. So it's not a perfect study design. Um, it wasn't true randomization in terms of, you know, having a, a, a good, like pure control group that, you know, instead of going on a farm tour, they like walked through <laughs> open fields for a couple of hours and heard about unrelated things that are unrelated to animal suffering. But it's a pretty good design that you can actually run um, when people have showed up to your farm sanctuary to go on a tour. You can't just tell half of them, sorry, you're, you're not getting the tour today. We're going to do something else with you. Um, so it's a, it's a balance with uh, basically gives you as strong a research design as you can given those kinds of limitations. Um, we also had in-person surveys on the New York farm. So Joe, our research director, went to the farm and, and sat down with people after the tour and talked to them about their experiences. And I'll share some of the, the data that came from that as well. Um, as a note on the sample, not surprisingly, vegetarians and vegans were overrepresented. So they, there were a greater proportion of vegans and vegetarians who show up to farm sanctuary tours than you'd find just on an average street corner. And that's really no surprise. Um, we also asked people why they came to the farm just to get a sense of, of why people were showing up. And the top two reasons given uh, were to interact with the animals, so it's a, a unique experience there, and to have fun. Um, and so it's worth noting that while, yeah, vegetarians and vegans are overrepresented, um, they're not um, they're not even the largest group, right? So omnivores were the single largest group, and over fifty percent of the people showing up were still eating meat in some way. Um, and some people, you know, just kind of came in because their their daughter wanted to go, or their wife wanted to come, or those kinds of things. So you do get a fairly varied crowd of some people even just saying, oh, we lived in the area and it was something to do on a Saturday. So we just dropped in like we've seen the signs. So why not show up kind of thing. So um, in terms of the results, um, 
the people who did this survey before the tour, so they've just come out of the parking lot and, you know, welcome and you get handed the survey. Um, compared to the people who did the survey before the tour, the people who did the survey after the tour were significantly more likely to see a connection between their diet and animal suffering. So they understood more the connection between the choices they made in the grocery store or the restaurant and what actually happens to animals on, on factory farms. They're also more likely to report that they're gonna reduce their consumption of each animal product category that we asked about. And so we asked about fish and seafood and beef and pork and chicken and turkey and milk products and egg products. Um, so this is a really good sign, right? It shows that as people are showing up, they have, they have you know, these certain views about the connection between animal suffering and their diet and these sort of intentions for, for diet change. And then we see that at the end of the tour, people are saying, okay, I understand more what's going on and, and I'm gonna change my diet in response to that. Um, and we actually did a follow-up as well. Um, so people provided their email addresses and we got in touch with them two to three months after the tour. Um, and the good news there was that down the road, people reported a significant reduction in their consumption of all of the animal products. So after they left the farm, um, this isn't just intentions anymore. And, you know, it is retrospective and we're asking them to sort of think back to the last two or three months. So not a full, you know, daily diary um, of what they consumed, but still good information that after leaving the farm, they did make those positive changes. Um, another positive thing that we saw there was that because Farm Sanctuary does a really good job of, of discussing animal agriculture in all its forms, there weren't substitution effects. So that's something we're worried about sometimes where people will sometimes eat more white meat after cutting out, um, cutting out um, uh, beef um, or eat more, more fish. Um, but we didn't see that. And we saw reductions across, again, across all the, the animal product categories. In terms of how people then chose to describe their diets. Um, we found that a third of the omnivores or people who were omnivore on the tour had taken some sort of positive step towards um, veganism in their self-described diet. So going from omnivore to a reducetarian or a vegetarian or all the way to vegan as well. Um, we also found that people who still ate animal products had high intentions to reduce their intake further. So kind of signals that they've already made some positive steps, but that they're, they're not done and they, their motivation to, to keep learning and changing um, remained high even two to three months after the tour. Um, so those are some pretty significant steps that people took uh, both on the tour and after the fact. Um, I wanted to share too some of the comments that we heard from people in the interviews because they can give you a sense of what kind of people are thinking and feeling in a way that numbers don't always. Um, so for the first quote, um, it was somebody talking about advocacy messaging as presented on the farm. And they said, you know, I thought it was effective. There's clearly, clearly an agenda, um, which is the care and compassion and trying to promote more plant-based diets, but it doesn't feel like, I didn't feel like I'm at church. And so, you know, farm sanctuary is like the original farm sanctuary, and they've been at this a long time, and they've, they've been tailing their message for a long time to sort of hit that middle ground where you're sort of shifting people as much as you can without pushing them too far where you get that sort of reactance and that that backfire boomerang effect um, so just watching people talking to people as they're going through the tour we always recommend formal evaluation when you can uh, it just gives you better data um, but if you if you pay attention over time you can definitely tailor that way as well so balancing that message seems to be seems to be important um, another consistent theme was the impact of just being around the animals um, and, the, and the impact it had on people. Um, so describing the most memorable part of the tour, one person said, I was just engulfed by sheep. It was great. They were just coming from all sides and it's amazing. Um, and yeah, lots of people really connected there and, and made connections too. A lot of people mentioned how huge the cows were. Um, because you don't realize just how big a cow can get if they're allowed to live their natural lives, right? Like they go to slaughter way too, way too young and um, it's not a fully adult cow that you ever really see standing in the fields. 
Um, other people were impressed by the turkeys that, that really wanted massages because uh, that's a thing. Um, other people were talking about, you know, this irate chicken that was like pecking their dad's back because he was paying attention to the wrong chicken. And so you could just really um, hear people connecting with the animals in a, in a really um, powerful way. So like the personality of the animals shone through and their intelligence. Um, animals that were that are often in popular media and such depicted as dull and, or unintelligent are clearly intelligent, full of personality. Um, one, one sort of gruffer gentleman who came in with his daughter talked about the pigs and he says, oh man, like they were saying the pigs just love lying around all day. And he said like, that's just as human as it can get. Like if, if it were me, that's what I would do. And he just sort of, you could hear that light bulb sort of clicking, so. Um, we also heard about themes of like rejuvenation and like recommitment among long-term vegetarians and vegans. So, you know, it's an inspiration to do better with our choices. It grounds me, brings me back to why we do what we do and why we've made the choices that we've made, the decisions that we've made. Um, others talked about a sort of a, a bit of a longer term struggle where, you know, it keeps me invigorated. I was heavily into animal rights in my twenties and I'm in my forties now. And some of that kind of died. It just kind of wears people down. But when I come to things like this, I get a bit rejuvenated again, reinvigorated and rejuvenated again. And we heard that a few times. So, um, yeah, so definitely interesting, um, interesting to hear all those takes. Um, again, worth pointing out that, you know, we think of, of farm sanctuaries as, as being a, a relatively high cost per animal housed. Um, but they do draw in a fairly broad segment of the population and even better. So, you know, you, you get these people walking around the farm who probably wouldn't seek out this information on their own, right? And even better, they're, they're paying you to be there. So you have this money coming into the movement that probably wouldn't have come in, in from, that, from that particular person or those particular people in other ways. And then you get a chance for them to meet the animals and to hear, hear a message over a bit longer period of time than just a flyer on the street or those kinds of things. So, um, and not to mention the diet change that was seen over time as well. So we were really encouraged by the, the findings and, and uh, yeah, thought it was interesting. Um, need more data to get into full cost analysis, that kind of stuff, but it was definitely uh, interesting and useful. Um, our next study, um, we wanted to know where manufacturers of plant-based alternatives should focus to reduce suffering as much as possible. Um, so the main question was, okay, if we wanna make a positive change, what, sh what products should we focus on first? We did this by looking at data on the consumption of animal products in the US and then combining it with data on the amount of animal product, um, amount of animal product in each of them um, and the amount of time it um, it takes to raise each animal. So the, the products responsible for most suffering or lives lost was determined by figuring out how much animal product was in each type of food. So how many grams or ounces of each animal um, flesh was in each food. Um, and you know, some, some foods have higher portion sizes and so therefore there's more um, weight of animal product in it. Um, and we also looked at how popular each food type was, meaning how many of those portions um, get consumed across the US. Um, so we also, so that was at the US like population level, what are the most you know, how, what products get eaten the most and how much animal product it is in each of those. Um, and we also looked at a per serving um, analysis too. So that's for, uh, for individuals. So if you're a one-time, per like a person who wants to know, okay, you know, I'm re reducitarian, uh, what are the first things I should be cutting out? That was an analysis for them. Um, so yeah, the first questions were, were like, what products do Americans eat the most and which of these lead to the most suffering and death? Um, and so if you're a manufacturer, focusing on those products can have the biggest impact. Um, I'm gonna try and flip screens here and hopefully we can all see. Um, if somebody can just tell me, can you still, still see my screen even though I flipped away from uh, PowerPoint there? 
Yes. Excellent. Um, so this is um, our analysis for manufacturers for um, for suffering. We can't we can't see the internet page, Tom. Oh, okay. Um, give me a second. Sorry, what are you seeing then? Your PowerPoint slides, just not full screen. Oh, I see. Hmm. Okay. Give me a second here. All right. We'll go to plan B then. And oh, okay, unfortunately, I'm not able to zoom in on these. Uh, again, available on the study. Um, so the, the first slide there, um, sorry, animal product impact scales, uh, study available on the website. Um, so, and we've, we've shared these elsewhere as well. Um, so I apologize for the, for the small size, uh, but yeah, the first, uh, the first panel there on the left is for manufacturers focusing on suffering. Um, and so this again takes into account just how often these foods are consumed and the amount of, of animal suffering that goes into each portion of them. So it, it takes both of those things to, into account. So scrambled eggs and omelets are at the top of the list. Uh, so from the manufacturers concerned with suffering, that would be a really good place to start. Chicken shreds and ground, um, unbreaded chicken breasts and fillets, uh, fillets sorry, and unbattered fish fillets uh, were at the top of the list there. Um, in terms of the most impact uh, for each product category, so if you're particularly inf interested in seafood, um, unbreaded shrimp uh, was at the top of the list in terms of impacts on um, lives per day uh, for that product category, uh, followed by breaded shrimp and unbreaded oysters, uh, mussels and clams. I also just want to add that um, in terms of scale of suffering and deaths, the seafood, and I, and I say seafood, animals used for seafood was so astronomically high that they were definitely an outlier. So when you see the numbers in the per category, the seafood numbers are just so much higher than all the other numbers that we didn't um, include them in the other scales in terms of top 10 products because it was just, it's so far removed from the other categories. So you'll notice that millions and millions and millions for shrimps. Um, so yeah, I just, I wanna point that out because you'll notice that those numbers are especially high. Yeah, thank you for that clarification, Casey. Yeah, for sure. Um, especially when you eat multiple um, instances of one organism in a meal like shrimp, right? Where, you know, at the top of the list, so animal products you should remove from your diet first. This is for individuals battered fish fillets um, was 12 days of suffering. And I believe it was, you know, for uh, every two or every two and a half portions um, of that, that meal, one animal life was lost. Um, but yes, with, uh, with things like shrimp and, and scallops where multiple are eaten, that's, that's off the scale as, as Casey pointed out. Um, followed by fish fillets, uh, breaded fish sticks and patties and, and fish soups and broth, um, just all based on that. Uh, and that, that sort of full analysis of, um, you know, they started thinking about what the animals were being fed and their lives and all of those kinds of things. So definitely a lot of information there, um, really useful to, to various groups. So sorry, again, we didn't have the, the full size slides. I think it locked me in when I was going, sharing full screen that only PowerPoint's getting shared. So, um, and yeah, we had that permissions issue because I guess I updated my software and you have to do that each time. So I apologize for that as well. I know I've shared on Zoom before. So, um, but yeah, all available on the website, faunalytics.org. Um, next, we'll talk about a study looking at beliefs around chicken and fish. Um, so this is our first study in a line of re research into small bodied animals. Um, and so we wanted to start at the beginning and just sort of see where people are at currently. Like, do they think that fish can feel, feel pain? Do they think that chickens are smart? Just sort of where are people right now? 
Um, and so we started with a scoping study where we asked both advocates and the public uh, what beliefs they thought people had. Uh, we then pared down a very long list of suggestions um, to a shorter list of about 35 beliefs for each animal. And those beliefs were in, in broad categories like personality and intelligence, um, and those types of things. Um, we asked a sample of, I think it was five, over 550 Americans, um, how strongly they endorsed each belief for either chicken or fish. So people, just to reduce participant burden, we didn't ask them a list of 70 plus items. We asked them just for either chicken or fish. You know, how much do you agree or, or disagree um, with, with this statement? So fish can feel pain, fish are loving, fish are beautiful, um, chickens have personalities, those types of items. We also asked them at the end to sign a petition to increase uh, the welfare of what animal, whatever animal they've just been answering questions about, and to take a diet pledge to reduce their consumption of that animal. And so those were kind of our outcomes. So not just sort of figuring out where, where people are at, which, which beliefs, you know, do we maybe not need to message around as much? Um, because people already kind of know that information or, or agree with that information. Uh, but we also wanted to see, okay, so if somebody agrees with this belief, does this, does that mean that they're more likely, more or less likely to, to agree to take these animal positive steps? So in terms of findings, um, more people signed the petition than took the diet pledge. And that makes sense, right? It's, it's easier to sign a petition to say, you know, I think we should take this next step towards animal welfare on, on fish farms or um, for chicken than it is to say, you know what, I'm gonna make a longer term commitment in my own life, you know, once I close this survey, close this web browser to make a change. So we weren't, we weren't terribly surprised to see that difference. Um, we also found that most people agreed that air and water quality are important to chickens and fish. And, and part of that may be, um, you know, there's a study by Mercy for Animals or MFA a few years ago, and they found that water quality was one of the main things that would sort of deter somebody from, from buying fish in a restaurant. And we think, you know, that's probably partly selfish where you're thinking about the quality of the food that you're consuming, but it's still an opportunity, especially, um, when fewer people agree that farms have horrible living conditions. So we think, okay, look, people understand that, that you know, chicken and fish need this fresh air and uh, certainly any commercial from a, a, an agricultural producer is gonna show you happy animals, right? Um, and so if they understand that that's necessary for the animals, um, but they don't understand yet the, what the reality is on a lot of industrial farms. That's an opportunity to sort of say, okay, we don't really need to convince them that the animals need this stuff, but we can focus on showing them that they don't have this currently, right? Like that's not the reality on industrial farms. Um, so we think it's a, a way that, you know, these findings could be used to help with messaging. In terms of the largest correlations with being willing to sign a pledge to reduce fish consumption. Uh, the top three items there were that fish are more intelligent than people give them credit for, um, that many farms have horrible living conditions and that fish are loving. So these findings mean that people who agree that fish farms are hor have horrible conditions are more likely to also agree to reduce their own consumption. Um, so this, again, it doesn't mean that everybody agrees with that, that statement, but those who do are also more likely to then be willing to take that next animal positive step. Um, and for people who don't agree, as I mentioned on the last slide, we think it's an opportunity to help educate them on that matter, right? Same thing with the idea that fish are loving and intelligent. So, you know, fish, there was a species of fish that passed the, um, oh, what's it? The mirror test, I think is what it's called, yeah. Um, and so it's, basically taken to mean, and I'm probably, you know, telling people on the call stuff they already know, but it's taken to mean they have a sense that they're looking at themselves in the mirror, that they have a sense of self. And it's, it's kind of creative. You put a mirror in with a fish and it, it sees itself in the mirror and it gets startled and, oh, is this a competitor that I'm going to have to, you know, vie with for territory? And then they kind of get used to it, but then they get a bit curious about what's happening. And so they would find that fish would actually like 
invert themselves and swim up to the mirror upside down. And so it's kind of like, wait, this fish is kind of curious, like trying to figure out what am I looking at here, right? And then they would actually put a mark on the fish where it could see it. And then the fish would see itself in the mirror and go and try to rub the mark off itself. And so that tells you, hey, the fish is aware that it's looking at itself. It's aware that it, that's it in the mirror. And so pretty cool study. You could educate people on it fairly quickly. Tell, talk about the other animals that we think of that are very intelligent that, that can also pass that. Or you know, talking about fish personalities and some of them seem to react uh, as though they have emotions after, after losing a partner, right? And so to just help people make those connections and then sort of see what effect it might have on their on subsequent animal, animal positive behaviors. In terms of correlations with signing the, the petition signature, again, more intelligent than people give them credit for, that fish are beautiful. Um, and again, that many farms have horrible living conditions. So again, we think educating people on that last point, the people who don't already understand and agree, educating them on, on that point is, is likely um, gonna be a benefit. Um, in terms of chicken, um, so large correlations with the pledge to reduce chicken consumption are that chickens are beautiful, um, that they need room to explore and exercise, and that they're loving. And in terms of the, the welfare petition signatures for chicken, again, room to explore and exercise, there's an easy contrast there with most industrial farms. Um, again, agreeing uh, about the living conditions on farms and, and chicken intelligence. So for our main takeaways, we were thinking, you know, try to message around the top beliefs to see if advocacy can be approved. Um, the broad categories that we saw is coming out on top. We're messaging around things like personality and emotion and suffering and the intelligence of these animals. So um, people who understood that more were, were more likely to, to do these animal positive things. Um, slightly different things were important for each animal, for each outcome. Um, but yeah, generally a good first step, we're, we're gonna partner with MFA um, to repeat these studies, including the, the initial cultural context scoping stuff in Brazil, India, and China. Uh, we also wanna move on to experimental manipulations to see, okay, let's educate people on this topic or that topic and see if we can, we can get a shift compared to a control group. So those types of things to, to take this line of uh, research into the next steps. So definitely stay tuned for that. And it, I will pass things back to Casey. Great, I was in the middle of answering the question in the chat, sorry. Oh, um, nice. So basically, we're, we're pretty much finished up, but I did want to mention three ways to keep up with our work um, and to get in touch if you have any other questions after this chat. Make sure you subscribe to our alerts. You'll be, um, receive, we'll be able to receive all of the updates on our newest research and studies that we've added to our library. Um, feel free to visit our website and have a look around as we have plenty of more research, including two other studies that we did this year um, that we didn't have time to mention today. We did a poll about the public's attitude toward COVID-19, and we also did a study on advocate retention, so how we can um, improve retention numbers and turnover numbers in the animal protection movement. So have a look at our website to see what else we've got. And then finally, please feel free to reach out to me at any time. Um, I'm usually the first person that answers the emails anyway to make sure that we're directing you to the appropriate researcher or member of our team. Um, so thank you so much again, and um, we are so excited to answer your questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tom and Casey. Um, and yeah, we've got a few questions that have come in, but definitely um, everyone should feel free to submit any additional questions in the chat. Um, so uh, the first question which comes to us from Krista is about the first study that you talked about um, with the cafe. Um, mm -hmm. Wondering if you're able to disclose um, which cafe it is. And then um, an additional question is, uh, did they charge more if someone added meat? How did the money play into this? Okay. Um... Yeah, I'm fairly certain. Let me just double check that. Yeah, no, I'm, yeah, we, we, uh, so it was at Carleton University. Um, we, we gave them a shout out and a thanks in the study. So yes, we can fully disclose. It was Rooster's Cafe at Carleton. If anybody uh, studied at Carleton or has been there for a conference or any of that kind of stuff. Um, 
In terms of prices, I believe the it, that was one of our first studies in the year, and I believe there were some more expensive vegetarian options as well. Um, I believe the the menu is available online, so if people wanted to sort of dig into that and compare, we, you know, it was it was sort of an afterthought on you know um, why why I did reducitarian the people who took the reducitarian pledge um, have less uptake while they're there. What does that mean? Does it mean that, you know, they didn't really follow through in any way? And we, we didn't feel safe coming to that conclusion. And we think of a few alternative hypotheses for it. Um, so that was the, that was the reasoning behind, behind that. But yeah, you can check the, the menu online if you, if you want to dig into the numbers, but yeah, I'm pretty sure the veg, if I remember correctly, and please forgive me if this is incorrect, but I believe some of the veg protein options were a bit more expensive as well. But yeah, have a look online. That's great, thank you. Um, then we have a question from Catherine who says, beyond doing these vegan consumer studies, have you done any research into how government subsidies and bailouts prop up animal agriculture and affect the total number of non-human animals killed for human consumption? Yeah, um, we haven't. Um, our main goal is supporting vegan advocates. Um, so, you know, you're an advocate on the street, what messaging should you use? Uh, should you go with videos rather than flyers or what kinds of approaches uh, should you use? Um, that's, I, I think, you know, there's a number of academic academics who've looked at that kind of stuff, those types of things. Um, definitely a major, major issue in, in terms of subsidies um, and something that does sort of prop that up. Our, our angle on that would be more if we educated people on those facts, how much would it help them change their mindset, those types of things. So that would be how we would approach that question. But yeah, I'm sure there's data um, showing that kind of stuff. That said, I, I do want to say that the legislative and the government stuff has been on our radar. And that's not to say we wouldn't sort of explore opportunities to look at this question in the future, because it is something that we're seeing more and more right now. And of course, um, is a really important question to ask. Thank you, Casey. Great. And then um, I know William has a question that he wanted to ask directly. <laughs> sure. Yeah, that's right. Thanks a lot for the presentation. Yeah. Um, I had a question, you know, about the substitution between uh, beef and chicken and fish, you know, because as you mentioned, you know, because there's like so many more individuals involved for chicken and fish, mm -hmm. even if there's just, for example, uh, sorry for the noise in the background, <laughs> <It's> <laughs> okay. for every unit of reduction in beef, if there was just like maybe 1% of substitution, that would completely negate the animal effects of uh, that uh, initial reduction. So I was wondering like if you, have any study like that or came across any study like that? I, I remember there was an, uh, an economic study, uh, a study by three economists like in November uh, 2019, where they also work with the cafeteria. I don't know if it was the same as yours. And they seem to think that there was not as much substitution as we expected, but uh, it's also seen that in their study that didn't include the salad bar purchase. And I think a lot of people include chicken within their salad, you know, at the salad bar. So yeah, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. And uh, if you think there would be an opportunity to do more studies on that in the future. Yeah, definitely, as I say, substitution effects are, are a big concern because as you say, and as we saw with the animal products, right, where you're, you know, if you're eating shrimp, you're eating 10 or 20 of them versus if you have a hamburger that's, you know, one one thousandth of a, of a cow or whatever, right? So it's definitely something uh, to, to keep in mind. I'm not sure off the top of my head on, on research on how prevalent it is in people who are first becoming vegetarian, those types of things. Uh, we didn't see in the two studies that kind of looked at it, we didn't see that uh, with, with the trends over time at Roosters or at Farm Sanctuary where we, we didn't see that bump in people con consuming more dairy or consuming more eggs or, or consuming more white meat or, or fish uh, where all those product categories dropped. And I, I think that's a, a bit of a testament to the messaging that Farm Sanctuary does where they make sure because they're clearly aware of that issue to make sure to describe all those different categories. So you're not just sort of shifting somebody from, from one animal product to another kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I don't know of, of any studies, at least off the top of my head that I can recommend, but it's definitely something that, that um, needs to be, you know, needs to be taken, given careful consideration when we're doing, doing advocacy work basically. 
Great, thank you. And um, we have another question from Krista who asks, do you have a plan to disseminate these findings in a robust and easy to read format for grassroots activists? Yeah, uh, we always try. Um, that's all of our studies are, uh, are available online. They're free. Uh, we try to put key findings right up front um, so that people can, can see what are our top line messages, what are our takeaways, what do we recommend, uh, what surprised us, um, those kinds of things. And then also we, uh, so, you know, on the first tab, we'll often have that sort of high level stuff. And then on future tabs, we'll have like methods and results. Um, if you want to see the full surveys, they're often available and those are, we'll have the link to the open science framework. So most of our studies are pre-registered. I guess all of our studies are pre-registered when we can. There was, I guess Farm Sanctuary wasn't because it started as a different product, so project. So we weren't even aware that we were going to publish it first. Um, but yeah, gen generally everything going forward is pre-registered. So you can see what we're going to do before we do it, um, see what the hypotheses are that we're going to test, see how we're going to test them. After the fact, we put our survey instruments up there. We put the data available as well, as well as the code that we use to analyze it. So in terms of, in terms of robust and, and open, uh, I think we're, we're doing the best we can there. Um, I mean, certainly suggestions for, for robustness. It's always a balance, right? Any study in the field, you have to balance uh, expense, participant burden, how much of their time you're asking for. Um, and so any one research study isn't gonna answer any complex question um, with finality, right? And, and research is all about, you know, converging evidence and replication and all of those types of things. So we, we absolutely do our best to balance um, and to, to produce this best science that we can given those kinds of considerations. So. I wanna jump in and just say, Krista, send me an email too. Um, I'd love to chat with this with you further about this. But one thing we've been trying to do is expand the ways that we're offering our research to advocates because we do recognize that most of the research on our website is, is great if you want to read research, but not everyone learns um, in a written style. So we've been testing out, you know, doing video releases, looking at fact sheets to make things more visually pleasing. Um, and so we're always looking for ways to make our research even more accessible for people. So um, I would love to hear more if you have any ideas or if there's something that you think isn't really quite right for people, especially for grassroots advocates in particular, who are often, um, yeah, operating in a different way than, than other advocates. So um, please, yeah, great. Send me an email whenever you can. Thanks. Yeah. Casey, as our content director, has been leading the charge on that and thinks about Instagram and all those kinds of things, or as, you know, researchers are more down in the weeds. So thank you for that, Casey. Awesome. Yeah, and we have a question from Yachi who asks, um, related to preventing the substitution effect, have you looked at the effectiveness of messages specifically for reducing just a few types of food, um, for example, eggs, chicken, fish? Yeah, we haven't haven't done specific messaging around there around that. Um, the let me just think. So we we no nothing like messaging specific to different animal products. Uh, we're starting because there's, there's relatively little uh, research being done. Um, we're sort of starting at, at square one. So we did a study on messaging, but it was messaging around, do you wanna present like one animal or do you wanna present like statistics on like however many animals there are. So like you present, hi, this is Susie and you know, tell about this one animal's life, because there's some evidence from like human charitable giving um, that that sometimes if, if the numbers get too big and certainly with, with fish, they're astronomical and I, I can't even really conceptualize trillions, right? Um, that, that people start sort of tuning out because it feels just too big of a problem. And so, you know, we're starting at that level of thing. And then once we've figured out some of the details on messaging and we're gonna keep diving down in. But yeah, at early stages, we haven't done anything like that. So. 
Then I have a, a question um, with the farm sanctuary tour end of things. Um, I'm curious what messaging and what the results were related to aquatic animals with that, um, since obviously that's a, a population that <laughs> you don't typically find at farm sanctuaries. Yeah, unfortunately, it was Joe who got to go to the farm. Um, so she actually like went on the tour with them. Um, I'm not sure if they would have information around that on their website or if it's something that they just reserve for the, the in-person walkthrough. But it's some, something we could certainly ask Joe and, and get back to the group on just to see how they're exactly positioning it. I think she might have mentioned it, but this is last summer when that was done. Well, no, like a year and a half ago <laughs> when it was done, obviously pre-COVID um when uh, when we were actually there um so yeah we could check in with her on on what the specific messaging is but i don't know off the top unfortunately thank you um and i know we just have a few minutes left um but i think we'd like to hear if you know what you'll be researching next year um and also maybe for both of you if there's one question in particular that you're really interested in investigating um whether or not something it's something that you know might be feasible to research in the short term um, I'll jump in here quickly and say, um, we actually, I'll be announcing this um, this coming week, but we will be doing a live video on the 22nd of December, where we will go over a few of the studies that we'll be producing in the next few years. Um, and so feel uh, more details on our, on our social media in the coming days, uh, Monday, I think I'll announce it. But um, just to give you a sneak preview, and sorry, Tom, not to cut in on, on the research okay. talk, but uh, yeah. we will be producing additional studies on attitudes and beliefs towards chickens and fishes um, in different cultural and geographical contexts, as well as how we can shift people's beliefs about chickens and fishes and start making more proactive changes um, to better protect these small bodied animals. We're going to be looking at barriers and supports to effective animal advocacy campaigns in China. We're going to be looking at a study of uh, vegans and vegetarians and how they transition to their diets and maintain their diets in the crucial early months, um, because that's often the most important time to make sure that we're, we're retaining these people who are joining our, um, our movement. And then we are looking at uh, some trends in animal advocacy as seen through social media, but I don't wanna get into too much of all of it because um, if you do tune into the video, you'll definitely learn more. And Tom, you, if you have anything to add. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I was just getting excited about Rocky's, uh, Rocky's chicken friend. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's great. Um, I guess, oh, and in terms of a question that we're interested in exploring, um, mm. you know what? I'm really excited. I'm actually really excited to see where our study in, um, on effective animal advocacy in China takes us. I'm particularly excited at that one because we're not just looking at, um, you know, we're looking at a few different things. We are looking at barriers and supports um, to potential barriers and supports to advocacy as seen through the eyes of advocates who are on the ground there. And then from there, we'll also be doing a study of the general public. And I'm, I'm particularly excited about this one because I think it's a really important opportunity um, to look at. And I think it's going to become even more important in the coming years, as, as we've said many times in, in this, this community. And so I look forward to releasing the results on that one. But I'm also a total sucker for anything about cultivated meat. So <laughs> if we do another study on cultivated meat, I will not be sorry because I, I think it's fascinating and important. And so that's, that's what I'm interested in. Yeah. For sure. And to answer for me, I, I'm really interested in, in looking at the chicken and fish study in those additional cultural contexts and, and starting at square one and like asking people who live there, you know, what beliefs do you think people have so that, you know, we're going to have the full list of 35 that we did in the US, um, but just so that we can compare across more accurately, but also to add those those additional pieces and just see how beliefs differ across different places and then start taking more steps down that research road and, and what can we actually do with what we're learning in that sort of framework, um, in those framework studies. So. That's great. Well, thank you both so much. Um, I definitely found this extremely informative um, and it seems like other people in the chat did as well. Um, so um, this is great. I'm not sure um, if you're both comfortable sharing your email addresses in case people want to have any follow up. Um, I think that would be great. Um, I shared a link in the chat if you're not already on our EAA event mailing list. Um, 
we do have these events monthly or twice monthly, the kind of general one, which is what today was, and then also our aquatic animal specific um, events as well. Um, we're beginning to plan the events for 2021. So if you have any ideas for future presentations or panel discussions or just topics that you'd like to see covered, um, definitely feel free to reach out. Um, you can contact me at rocky at ali.fish, which I will also share in the chat right now. Um, and uh, yeah, we uh, again, thank you. Really enjoy this presentation and look forward to continuing the conversation. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much, Hi, everyone. Everybody. Thank you so much for joining us.